Thanks so much for tuning in to this special Good Friday broadcast. Uh, as we sit and record this live, it's about 1 p.m. here on Good Friday in 2023. And whenever you're watching this, I want to let you know that the same power that's made available and what God is doing for those that are watching live will be made available uh, to you that may be listening by replay or by podcast. But I wanted to do a very special Good Friday broadcast to celebrate the work of the cross and what Jesus did on the cross and to celebrate what it accomplished for us. There's many religious individuals that on Good Friday make it a day of mourning and a day of sadness. Um, the Bible college that I attended, every Good Friday I would dread it because they would make the chapel like a funeral death service. Uh, it would be full of depression and darkness and sadness. But that's not what Jesus desires for Good Friday. Good Friday is a celebration of the fact that Jesus Christ paid the price, and we know that some three days later, early on Sunday morning while it was still dark, Jesus arose in power and in victory. Can somebody type amen? So I want to take us into John chapter 19 today to read a little bit about what happened on Good Friday. What is it that Jesus did? Uh, what is it that happened to him? And what did it do for us? And why is this day worth celebrating? Why is this not a day to mourn as those that are in religious constructs might do, but as true Christians, true believers in Jesus, why should this be a day when we are celebrating and a day when we are rejoicing? Let's get into it. John 19, verse number 1. The Bible says this, After the Jews rejected Barabbas to be uh, kept in exchange and Jesus released, and they screamed, for Barabbas to be released, Pilate didn't know what else to do because the people were screaming, crucify him. So the Bible tells us here, Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail the king of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out and said to them, Behold, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said of them, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him. I don't find any fault. The Jews answered, We have a law according to our law. He ought to die because he made himself out to be the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard this saying, he was all the more afraid and went into the praetorium and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus did not answer him. And we're going to see from Isaiah in just a second why that is. Then Pilate said to him, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? Jesus answered, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you, he has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out all the more, saying, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate heard this saying, he brought Jesus out and sat him down in the judgment seat. That is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now, it was the preparation day of the Passover, about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold, your king. But they cried out, saying, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. So we see all throughout Good Friday, the screams of crucify him are harrowing through Jerusalem. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered him to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus away. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the Skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side, and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, writing, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read the title for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. It was a place where there were people of all different uh, languages and backgrounds. And so the Bible says it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore, the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews. But he said, I am the king of the Jews. 
But Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. I want someone to write that in the comments. What I have written, I have written. That was prophetic, a prophetic statement. This is the king of the Jews. Pilate was being used to prophesy. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, each a soldier apart and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from top to bottom. Therefore the scriptures were fulfilled. They divided my garments among them, and from my clothing they cast lots. And the Bible goes on to say here that uh, Jesus passes off his mother Mary to John and says, uh, Mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. We'll continue and skip that just for time, uh, time's sake. Verse 28, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put on hyssop, and put it into his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. In the Greek, tetelestai. And we'll get back to why this is in just a moment. Bowing his head, he gave up his spirit, or he died. Now I want to turn to Mark's account very quickly, Mark chapter 15. If you have a Bible, turn there with me. Mark gives us some other details that I want to add in here as to what's going on. We're going to start in verse 15 of Mark here, Mark 15, verse 15. Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them. Remember I said he tried to give them Jesus. They said, no, give us Barabbas, the criminal, and that's what Pilate did. And he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. The soldiers led him away as the same thing uh, was said in the Gospel of John. But verse 17 here adds something a little bit more. And they clothed him with purple, and they twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and began to salute him, Hail the king of the Jews. Then they struck him, or slapped him, on the head with a reed, and spat on him. And bowing the knee, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. So they had mocked him, spit on him, slapped him, said, oh, all hail the king of the Jews, all hail the Christ. Total mockery. Uh, Mark tells us that there was a man named uh, Simon from Cyrene that was forced to help carry the cross. Uh, there were two, obviously two robbers. They were crucified with him. But this is what I want to add from Mark's gospel here, starting in verse number 29. Mark 15, verse 29. Mark says this, those who passed by Jesus hanging on the cross blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from that cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking among themselves with the scribes, said, He saved others, but he can't save himself. Let the Christ, the King of the Jews, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him also mocked him. Could you imagine that? They're condemned to death for uh, hanging on crosses as well, yet they're mocking Jesus in the center. Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land till the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we'll get to that in just a moment. Some of those who stood by when they heard that said, Look, he's calling for Elijah. Then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine, put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink, saying, Let him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come take him down. Jesus then cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. John tells us the last thing he said was, It is finished. Then the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. So when the centurion who saw this saw it, cried out and, and said, truly this was the man, the son of God. Interesting. Now, I know I just read a bunch of text, but let me tell you why I did that. Because I want to show you today what happened on this Good Friday. Those are two gospel accounts that tell us what happened. But I want to go back to the Old Testament prophet of Isaiah. Someone type in the comments, Isaiah 53. But I want to show you the true brutality of what happened. 
And Isaiah saw with his own eyes by vision what happened to Jesus. He didn't know who Jesus was. He called him the servant of the Lord, or what we call this last servant song, the suffering servant. That's what Jesus was revealed to be in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah didn't know who Jesus was. Isaiah lived thousands of years before Jesus ever came onto the scene, yet by prophecy and by vision, he saw what happened. And in Isaiah 52 and verse number 14, Isaiah says this about what happened to Jesus. He says, just as many, just as many were at first astonished at you, so now his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the son of man, or the sons of men. What Isaiah was saying here is the true brutality of the crucifixion. This word visage here means appearance. And so what Isaiah was saying was this crucifixion, this, uh, this beating was so brutal that he was his appearance, which is what visage means, was marred beyond that of any man. What that meant was Jesus was so brutally beaten, so brutally scourged, so brutally attacked, so brutally harassed, that it was difficult to tell who it was that was hanging on the cross. He was no longer identifiable as Jesus of Nazareth that they had come to know. They were just saying, who, who is that up there? We can't tell who that is. Is this Jesus? Who is this person? But Isaiah goes on to say, not only was he no longer recognizable in his own personhood, but he goes on to say that he was beaten uh, or that his form was so uh, disfigured beyond that of the sons of men. This meant that the physical body, the frame of Jesus, was so disfigured that you couldn't even tell what was on the cross anymore. You couldn't tell that it was even a human being. Without being irreverent, I want to tell you what Isaiah was saying here was, it just looked as if a chunk of meat was hanging on the cross. That's the level to which he was beaten, the true level to which he was marred. And, uh, you know, there's a movie that's famous, most people know about, The Passion of the Cross, that does an okay job uh, depicting this. But it was far worse than that, friend. It was the worst beating in all of human history. And that's why Jesus refused the first drink, which had gall in it, that was offered to him, because that would have been like a painkiller. But Jesus came to take all our pain. He wasn't going to allow any of the pain to be dissipated because by prophecy he had to take it upon himself. Now if you remembered at the very first verse in John chapter 19, the Bible says Pilate turned Jesus over to be scourged. And this is what we call the whipping or the flogging of Jesus. And Isaiah prophesies about it. We're going to read it in just a moment. But what happened was before Jesus went to the cross, he took a stop that, I, that Isaiah identifies was for the healing of your physical body. But what happened was, at a flogging post or a whipping post or in a scourging, the Romans would have like a whip that would be braided oftentimes with leather straps, and on the end of those leather straps would be shards of animal bone, metal, glass sometimes, and even lead balls to make it more weighted. And what the Roman soldier would do is take that whip and they'd beat the back of the individual, rip it down, and then pull it out. And as they'd pull it out, chunks of flesh, blood would go flying everywhere. Now the Jews had a law that they could only beat a Jewish individual 40 stripes save one or 39 times. But the Romans had no limit. And many times the Romans would beat these individuals to the point of them being unconscious and there'd be many people that would not even survive this beating. Because as they would beat the person, they'd use all their strength and whip their back, rip it down and pull it out. And as they would do that, the person's back would become exposed, the flesh would be missing. Many times you'd be able to see the internal organs, the kidneys, you'd be able to uh, start to see uh, the lungs expanding and collapsing as they struggled to breathe. It would be a beating uh, to the point of near death. And like I said, many of these would actually die. So Jesus was in that condition, by which point he was then forced on Good Friday to carry his own cross to Golgotha's hill. And that's why, because he was so weak already at the point of death, that the soldiers made a man named Siren of Cyrene help Jesus 
carry the cross to Golgotha's hill. But I want to continue reading in Isaiah's prophecy because like I said, Isaiah saw all this happening. And Isaiah gives us the reasoning and the, the, the true goings on behind what is happening. Isaiah 53 and verse 1, Who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. For he shall have no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. Jesus was not something special in the flesh, is what Isaiah was saying. But Isaiah goes on to say, He is despised and rejected by men. Remember, Isaiah saw the trial of Jesus. He saw them shouting, crucify him, crucify him. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. We despised him. We did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Isaiah said, we thought he was being attacked for his own crimes. That's what they were saying. He, you know, he makes himself out to be the son of God. He's a blasphemer. We thought God was striking him down for something he did. But Isaiah says, oh no, you have to understand the reality. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes, or by the scourging, or by the flogging that he was condemned to, we our healed. Like sheep we have all gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Who has taken, he was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Speaking of him being buried in a rich man's tomb, the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Again, Isaiah prophesied this thousands of years before Jesus ever came on the scene with perfect accuracy. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prevail in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. And so Isaiah said, everything Jesus went through on the cross was not for any sin he committed, but it was all for us. Someone type in the comments, it was for us. He paid the price for us on that cross. And that is why Jesus said in John 19 and verse 30, it is finished. Because what you have to understand is the cross was a substitutionary work. Jesus was dying in our place. It was also a vicarious work, meaning Jesus died as us. Jesus died. He took it upon himself so that we could be forgiven. As Isaiah said, he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. Can someone say amen? So what is it specifically that Jesus finished? When he said it is finished, what is it that was finished? Number one, he fulfilled prophecy. For the Old Testament had prophesied time and time again concerning what it was Jesus would do when he came, which is why Jesus said in Luke 24 and verse 44, saying to his disciples, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Jesus said everything you read in the Old Testament, what Isaiah prophesied, it was because of me. And when I died on the cross, when I was about to give my last breath and declared it is finished, I said it because prophecy was fulfilled. Every prophecy that was made concerning the Christ, the Messiah in his first coming, in his vicarious death, in his sacrificial death, in his atonement is fulfilled. It is finished. 
Not only that, but the very wrath and the justice of God was then satisfied. For the Bible says, the wages of sin is death. Only a sinless, spotless lamb of God could pay the sin for sinful humanity, really pay the debt, rather, that sinful humanity owed. That's what the Bible says in 1 Peter 18 through 19, you need to know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless way of life that you received from your fathers. No, but what the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So the Bible says Jesus went to the cross as the sinless, spotless lamb of God who was able to pay the debt that we owed to make the atoning sacrifice. And that's what Paul teaches in Romans chapter 3. Romans 3 and verse number 21. It's what Paul has to say under the inspiration of the Spirit. The Bible says, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified now freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation, which means the one who absorbed the divine wrath. God poured out his wrath on Jesus on the cross so that you never have to taste it. Can someone type amen? As the propitiation by his blood through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Only through the cross of Jesus Christ could God remain the just God that demands payment for sin while also pouring out his wrath upon Jesus, who was the one that paid the price so that he could justify us who were sinful, so that we would never have to pay the price, but Jesus instead paid the price for us. Can someone type, amen? It was finished. The wrath of God was appeased and satisfied. The justice of God was made complete. Not only that, but he defeated all the power of the devil, Colossians 2, 14 through 15, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, having taken it out of the way by nailing it to the cross, having disarmed the principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle over them, triumphing over them in it, his death on the cross. The devil was defeated by his death on the cross. It is finished. Not only that, but he took the curse of sin and the iniquity of the world. He took my sin and your sin, and he crucified it in the flesh. Isaiah 53 and verse 6, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Galatians 3 and verse 13, uh, the Bible says, praise God, that uh, he became the curse for us on the cross. As it is written, cursed is everything that hangeth on a tree, or Christ has redeemed us from the curse pronounced from the law. As it is written, cursed is everything that hangs on a tree. So sin was dealt with. It is finished. Not only that, but he, if he affected the reconciliation between God and man. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. And I'm going through this kind of quickly because I want to get to uh, something cool that's going to wrap this up. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18. I'm trying to show you all the reasons why he said it's finished, and then we're going to wrap this thing up with someone that's going to help me say it better than I'm saying it right now. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing the trespasses to them, and has committed to us this word of reconciliation. 
Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. See, because of sin, God and man were at odds with each other. There was no right relationship. Relationship was broken in the Garden of Eden. But the Bible says that through the cross of Christ, there was a reconciliation. Romans 5 and 1 confirms this. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we now have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Before the cross, there was no peace with God. Colossians 1 and verse 20. And by him, all things were reconciled to himself, whether things on the earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And the veil that tore, that Mark tells us about, and Matthew and Luke tell us about, in the temple that tore when Jesus gave up his breath and died, is a visual proof that man could now come back into right relationship with God. For that thick veil is what separated unholy humanity from the holy place where God's presence dwelled. But when Jesus gave up the ghost, that thick veil tore as a visual representation that the, uh, the I guess we'll say, animosity between God and man had been torn down by the cross of Jesus Christ. It was a visual representation that the separation between God and man, between holy and unholy, between sinful and sinless was now broken because the bridge was gapped. The divide, there was now a connection that was made. There was, I guess we'll say it like this, that chasm between God and man, which was sin, was now bridged. And what is it that bridged the gap? It was the cross of Jesus Christ. That's how you can think of the cross, as a bridge between holy God and unholy humanity that bridged that separation place. Can somebody type amen? And so Jesus was saying it is finished because he fulfilled all these areas of prophecy. He brought man back into right relationship with God, and then he died. And if somebody would just recognize all the things that were accomplished through the cross, they'd realize there's no reason to cry. Not only because we know that a resurrection is coming early Sunday morning, but we know what the cross of Jesus Christ has accomplished for us, in us, and through us. But I want to introduce you uh, to one of the greatest preachers and one of my favorite that ever lived, uh, that preached a message entitled The Dawn of a New Day. And I have a uh, little excerpt from that message I'm going to play for you because he's going to do a much better job preaching what I just tried to explain to you uh, than I just did. Because uh, there, there's no one that I know of that has preached the passion narrative as strong and as well as Bishop G.E. Patterson. So I want you to take a look at this clip uh, that he preached, one of his later messages in life. But it's one of my all-time favorites, and it's going to stir your faith up. Uh, but I want you to check him out, watch this clip, and I'll be back with you at the end to wrap up. We'll pray and take communion. And then uh, we'll go rejoicing over the fact that the price has been paid and Jesus was crucified, risen from the dead. And because he is alive, we can live. But nonetheless, ladies and gentlemen, introducing to you the great Bishop G.E. Patterson. And this is what I mean when I talk about yesterday. Yesterday was a day of betrayal. Yesterday was a day of pain and suffering. Yesterday was a day of lies and false allegations. Yesterday was a day of trials before unjust judges. Yesterday was a day when Satan thought he had the victory. But as he hung on Calvary's rugged cross, dying, even the heavenly father looked down at Calvary and he saw your sin and mine. He saw Jesus covered with addiction. He saw Jesus covered with murder. He saw Jesus covered with lies. He saw Jesus covered with every sin that a man could commit. And when the father looked on him, Habakkuk said, Thou art of pure eyes than to behold evil, and you can't even look on iniquity. When God saw the sins of the world covering up Jesus, 
God the Father turned his back and I hear Jesus say, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabekana, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? And in a minute, he hung his head in the lock of his shoulder and said, it's finished. I came to build a highway. It's finished. I came to fulfill prophecy. It's finished. I came to redeem man from sin. It's finished. I came to show there is a better way. It's finished. I came to show sick folk that they really can be healed. It's finished. I came to make somebody's out of nobody. It's finished. Ah, it's finished. Hallelujah. And in a minute, he had already said, no man can take my life from me. I lay it down of myself that I might take it up again. And he said, Father, in the thine hands, I commend my spirit. And he blew his own lights out, hung his head in the lock of his shoulder, and gave up the ghost. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus went to Pilate and begged for his body, wrapped it after they had massaged it with a mixture of myrrh and aloes, put him in Joseph's new tomb. I've been telling you for years, Joseph didn't mind letting them have the tomb because Joseph knew it would only be temporary. Jesus wouldn't need it for eternity. He just wanted to borrow it for the weekend. Go ahead. Put me in the grave. Go ahead. Woo. Put me down in the tomb. I'm not worried because I'm going to rise again. They put him in the grave. According to Peter, 1 Peter 3.18, he went back into the antediluvian world, preached to the spirits that were alive on the earth back during the time of Noah. Blessed be God, came out of the antediluvian world back into this present time. Spirit of the Lord got back in that body and early early what we call Sunday morning good gun from on high stepped out of the tomb dangling some keys saying all power all power in heaven and earth is in my hand it was the dawn of a new day he was defeated, looked like yesterday, but now he's standing in victory. He's standing there saying, death, I dare you to look in my direction. Grace, get out of my way. I came like a little baby yesterday, but I'm back fully vested in the glory of my father. I can do all things. I can walk through walls. I can float on the cloud. I got power over death. Oh, it's a new day. Turn to somebody and said, Jesus died and rose again that you might have a new day in your life. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what the enemy is trying to do to you. But let me tell you, Thursday is over. Friday is over. And it's a new day. You may have been defeated yesterday, but God's going to give you new power today. You may have been sick yesterday, but healing is yours this morning. The enemy may have beat you down yesterday, but victory is yours this morning. Oh! Ah! oh, come on, praise God. If that doesn't get you uh, 
excited. Your exciter is broken. Uh, he was one of the greatest preachers uh, that ever lived. And uh, I'm telling you, that, that, that stirs me up every single time that I listen to it. I love it. One of my favorite messages ever preached. But it's finished, friend. The dawn of a new day is here. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ is why Good Friday is good. It's why we can celebrate. It's why we don't have to be sad and depressed and go through the, the emotions and whatever. The Bible says the Lord was pleased to lay all the sin on Jesus. If the Lord was pleased, how much more should we be happy, excited that the price has been paid? I don't get sad when I think about the cross. It does make me think about the weight of sin and the wage of sin and the cost. And I'm thankful, moved to tears by thankfulness. But I'm not sad for Jesus. Jesus knew what he was doing. The Bible says he looked forward to you and to me, to the fruit of what it was he was going to produce. And that's why he endured the cross, because he looked forward to what was going to happen. He looked forward to the billions that would be set free from the power of sin and would come into the fellowship of Almighty God. Praise the Lord. And the resurrection, friend, is proof that it is finished. Someone type in the comments, it's proof that it's finished. Revelation 1, 17 through 18. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. But behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Jesus is alive, and because he is alive, we can celebrate today uh, over everything that he did. I'll say to you today what the angel said to the woman in Luke 24, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. And so I want to remind you today on Good Friday, as we commemorate and we remember what Jesus did, don't get into a headspace that he's dead or that he's going through it, you know. There's some Christians that I really begin to wonder every year around Easter if they think every year Jesus has been crucified, buried, and resurrected, as if it's just happening new every single year. Think in your mind this happened once. The Bible says he died once for sin. Now he lives forever and ever. So though we can remember, he's alive. Someone shout, he's alive in the comments. Type in the comments. And that is why we're going to celebrate communion right now, because that's what Paul instituted communion to be. It's a celebration. Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me. Whenever you take it, do it in remembrance of me. And communion is not a sad event. Communion is a holy event of celebration where we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You know what that means? That, uh, that uh, wraps it all in, that Paul made it clear, communion is celebrated in the context that he's coming again. If Jesus is coming again, that must mean that he is alive. And so we take communion to celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Can someone type amen? So, like I said, this is going to be a short one today. We're only about 40 minutes in, but I don't have much to say. I just wanted to come on and uh, celebrate with you, read the Bible with you, and uh, give God the glory. I did an entire Easter series you can go back and watch. I pretty much poured out everything I had. So this is just kind of a uh, impromptu celebration with you that watch and that enjoy me and uh, enjoy the ministry. So if you have your elements, go ahead and grab those, the bread and the juice. Let me grab mine. And I'll just say you can't take communion with Kool-Aid. It must be taken with fruit of the vine, which we know to be grape juice according to the scripture. So I know there's a bunch of people. Can I, can I use M&Ms for the bread? No, you cannot. You could use bread <laughs> as Jesus instituted, and you can use fruit of the vine, which would be grape juice. We don't drink alcohol. All right. 1 Corinthians 11, verse number 23. I'll read you Paul's uh, letter to the Corinthians, but it's what you often hear during communion. It's what we'll read right now. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, for this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So every single time we take communion, we take the element of the bread, we remember that his body was broken for me. It wasn't broken for God. He broke it for me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So the element of the cup represents the blood that was shed that affected in us reconciliation between God and man and gave us the new covenant, the access to God that we now have freely by the blood of Jesus. Verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So I'm taking these elements to proclaim the victorious death of Jesus Christ. But I'm taking it in the context of the fact that I know he's coming again, which means he's alive. Someone type amen. Praise God. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and many have died. So, before we partake of communion today and celebrate, I want to give those watching that may not know the Lord Jesus the opportunity to get saved, and those of you that may be believers that have sin in your life you have to get rid of, I'm going to give you an opportunity to examine yourself and deal with that so that when you take the elements of the bread and of the cup, you take so in a worthy, holy manner. Because this is a prophetic event. Though this is juice, though this is bread, as we take them, we take them as symbols that affect in us the work that Jesus did on the cross. As you take the communion by faith, you'll be healed in your body. As you take the communion by faith, every wicked thing in your life will break off. Because the very fact that we do these things, we're actually prophetically proclaiming. It's an act of faith. We're proclaiming to Jesus. We're proclaiming to heaven. We believe. We believe. We believe. It is finished. So if that's you, you're watching. You don't know the Lord Jesus, but you want to. Pray with me right now what many people call the sinner's prayer. Ready? Pray this. Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, I realized I'm not right with you. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, and I confess with my mouth Jesus Christ is Lord and my Savior. Thank you, Father. I'm a Christian now. Thank you. You sent Jesus to die for me. I believe it is finished. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that for the first time, go to my website, wesleyangre.com. Click on I Just Got Saved. Fill out that form, and I'll send you a free gift. Uh, that will help you in your walk with God. If you're a believer and there's sin in your life, there's something you know you got to get rid of, just tell God this, Father, I'm sorry. I repent. Wash me clean that I may partake of these elements in a worthy manner. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. All right, let's do it. If you have the element of the bread, you can go ahead and lift it up. We'll pray and we'll partake and then we'll partake of the cup, give you a chance to give, and then we'll go, giving God the glory. Ready? If you have your element, lift it up. Father, I pray that you'd bless these elements. I give you thanks as Jesus did. I give you thanks for what Jesus did on that cross. And in the command of the scripture, we partake of this ordinance to proclaim your death until you come. In Jesus' name, amen. You may partake now of the element of the bread. If you have your cup, you can lift it up. I'll give you a few moments. Father, we thank you for the element of the cup. We thank you. Praise God. For the new covenant in your blood. We thank you for making a way for us with your blood into the holy place. In Jesus' name, amen. You can partake of the cup.
Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. And if you're watching, you're sick in your body, you're believing God. I saw at the beginning someone was believing God to be debt free. I tell you by faith it's already done. I tell you by faith as we took the communion, everything in your life has been made right. All sickness was just driven out. Every attack of the devil broken because we took those elements in faith. We proclaim the power of the death of Jesus. We proclaim the power of his resurrection. We declared it is finished. Someone type in the comments, it is finished. Praise the Lord. Thanks for being on with me on this Good Friday. I'm praying for your services tonight, wherever you will be celebrating, uh, that God would move, people would get saved and set free in Jesus' name. If you so desire, I'll throw up the way to uh, the ways to give today. If you want to sow something, God moved in you, God spoke to you to do something today, uh, to sow into the work of the kingdom, you can do so online. WesleyAngre.com forward slash give, debit and credit. If you want to send a check, make it payable to Wesley Angre Ministries, P.O. Box 816, Fitchburg, Massachusetts, 01420, Cash App, WAM Give, Venmo, WAM Give, and PayPal, WAM Give. And I thank you in advance for everything that you give and that you sow today. It will be used for the advancement of the gospel. We have big things planned this year in the ministry. Evangelistic campaigns are on the horizon. And if you want to partner with what we're doing and you want to sow and, and tell God that you care about the gospel this resurrection season, we'll be grateful to receive your seed in Jesus' name. Well, I trust you enjoyed today. Uh, it was great to be on with you. I kind of just, you know, went with the flow. I didn't have much prepared at the beginning, but I figured, you know, let's just read the scripture. You can't go wrong reading the Bible. Can somebody say amen? If you enjoyed this, let me know in the comments. If you have any questions, anything you want to say before we go off, I'll be happy to engage with those of you that are on. If not, we'll go off. I see there's still several individuals on. Amen. Praise God. It's finished. That's right. It is finished. It's finished. Praise God. Well, I don't see anything. So I guess we'll go off. This concludes our Easter series. And we did several, several broadcasts. I think we started with why did Jesus have to die on the cross? The Passion Week timeline, resurrection power, proof Jesus really is alive. Then this uh, special broadcast today. So happy to close the chapter on this Easter series. Uh, a lot of study, a lot of time went into all of those, but I'm doing it to help you and bless you and see to it that God is touching and saving and uh, working in your life. In Jesus' name, until I see you again, go in the grace, the peace, and the power of God.